Hi, Reverend Kim Polter here from Marshfield United Methodist Church and the Streams YouTube channel. I am wearing my newest snarky t-shirt because apparently I have gotten into a battle of snarky t-shirt gift giving with a friend and it was her turn and this is fantastic. I wore it to work. I'm working now. So today's Streams sermon is uh, the beginning of a five-week series called Shipwrecked Leading Through Disaster. It's based on the shipwreck story in Acts 27 and 28 that I guess I skipped reading when I was in seminary and in my devotional reading through the past 20 years. So it's brand new to me. I think there's some extra excitement because of that. And I hope that comes across to you. It did to one of my clergy friends who said, girl, how did you preach a sermon on intersectionality without ever even saying intersectionality? Way to go. Anyway, I hope it's fun for you. I think it'll be an interesting five weeks. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the streets. This is Acts chapter 27, verses 1 through 20. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship for Adramitium, about to sail for ports <clears throat> along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we arrived at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Nidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete, opposite Salmone. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of La Silla. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we would sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. But before long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster came sweeping down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it, and we were driven along. As we passed to the lee of the small island of Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. About three weeks before the lockdown, I stood in front of my last congregation and asked them to pray with me about the spread of COVID-19. And they looked a little surprised. You might remember. It was bad at first, but it was something that was happening far away in China. People were dying, but over there. I told them a few cases had been reported in Italy, 
And that's why I was concerned. I've spent significant periods of time in two countries besides our own, China and Italy. And here's what I know. The Chinese can follow instructions. Once it hit Italy, I knew it would be here in a matter of days or weeks. And it was. Someone from church came back to me a few weeks later and said, well, you were right, which are, of course, some of my very favorite words. And then they said you were prophetic, you know, like a prophet. I replied to them that prophecy is one of the most misunderstood concepts in the Bible. We think of prophecy as sitting here in time telling the future, but prophecy is usually simply telling the truth paying attention to what's going on around us, keeping a close enough relationship with God that we understand what is happening, and then having the courage to say the truth out loud, even if what we are saying is just blowing against the wind. Think of the biblical prophets. So many of them are saying a similar thing. If we keep going the way we are going, we are going to be destroyed. Was that future telling? Well, from now, which is the future, it might seem like that because we know most of the time they kept doing what they were doing and they got mostly destroyed because that was the past and we can see it from here. But to the people saying those things in their present, they weren't predicting the future. They were telling their neighbors the truth, the hard truth, the mostly ignored truth. Paul was on his way to Italy not to go see his in-laws or the sites. He was not there on vacation. He wasn't really even there on mission, at least not directly or maybe intentionally. Paul was a Roman citizen. He was a trained Pharisee. He was a called apostle of Jesus Christ. He was getting on a boat. No, he was getting on a ship with 275 other people, but not as a passenger as a prisoner under transport from Caesarea to Rome. Paul was arrested because of complaints from the Jewish leaders, and some of them wanted him to die. But once again, the Romans were in charge with their whole legal system and trials. So Paul was tried before Governor Felix, whose wife was Jewish, scripture tells us. Felix, to appease the Jewish leaders, simply kept Paul in prison for two years and waited to see if Paul would bribe him. Then another governor came, whose name was Festus. And as soon as Festus came to Caesarea, Festus asked to see Paul. Paul made his case before Festus, and then he appealed to Caesar, the emperor of the Roman Empire. Festus was confused because Festus does not see these issues (laughs) before Paul as Roman charges. He sees them as intra or interdenominational squabbles. So either it was something among one group of religious people or between two different groups of religious people. But either way, it's a religious thing. It's a Jewish thing. Why are the Romans even involved? That's what Festus wants to know. King Herod Agrippa comes to visit Caesarea and Festus tells him about Paul. In Acts 25, 18 to 20, Festus says to Agrippa, King Agrippa, when his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. It gives you a sense of how confusing the Jewish Christian divide was to the Romans in authority. But Festus said this to Herod Agrippa, King Herod Agrippa, who was the last Jewish king of Judah. Agrippa understands. He understands this squabble. So King Agrippa asks to see Paul. When Paul makes his case before King Agrippa, Agrippa basically accuses Paul of using this little bit of time to try to convert him to Christianity or the way, as they called it then, And Paul replies to Agrippa in Acts 26, 29, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. I didn't expect the snark. 
I didn't expect the extended trial coverage. I didn't expect the intrigue and the sidebars between the jurors. You know, I didn't expect Paul to say, so for these tunes, this is not what we expect from our scripture. And it is not what Agrippa expected from Paul. King Agrippa just gets up and leaves. And he says to Festus as he's walking out in 2632, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. They could find no charges to file against him. The Romans had no beef with Paul. They had a complaint from the Jewish leaders and they had Paul demanding a trial before Caesar, emperor of the Roman Empire. So, okay. So Paul's getting on a boat. No, getting on a ship with 275 other people. Not as a passenger, but as a prisoner under transport from Caesarea to Rome. Not convicted, but held already in custody for two years on the word of the Jewish leaders with no charges after three trials, a waiting trial before Caesar that he himself demanded. Because he was a called apostle of Jesus Christ. He was a trained Pharisee and Paul was a Roman citizen. Have you ever been there? I don't mean on, on a ship being transported as a prisoner, although okay, or in Caesarea, but in a rough spot because of the combination of things you are. Have you ever been in a rough spot because others didn't understand that combination or, or like what you were doing because of it? Or also maybe in a spot because of your own decisions? It's in moments like these that we often say, this is bad, but at least it can't get any worse. It can get worse. It does get worse because it was absolutely the wrong season to get in a boat on the Mediterranean. Paul makes a prophetic statement. He tells them the truth in Acts 27.10. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and being bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But did they listen to Paul? No, because Paul was a Roman citizen. He was a trained Pharisee. He was a called apostle of Jesus Christ. But he was not a professional sailor. In Acts 27, 11, we hear that the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. You know, like you do. You listen to the guy who owns the ship and the captain who drives the ship, not the prisoner you're transporting. A nor'easter blows up. They have to put the lifeboat on the ship itself. They have to put ropes around the ship to hold it together. They have to lower the anchor to slow them down and create drag. They throw their cargo overboard, which makes the trip less profitable. They throw their gear overboard, which makes it less safe. The clouds are so bad, they don't see stars or sun for days. And the storm rages and rages on until we hear, we finally gave up all hope of being safe. You know those moments when you think things can't get worse and then they do get worse? This is that moment. It's not what we expect. Just like we don't expect to find a trial drama in the Bible or shipwreck stories or Paul making things worse by exercising his rights as a Roman citizen or just being stubborn or people ignoring Paul. I mean, this is Paul. Or we don't expect to find Paul's life in grave danger mid-ministry. It's not what we expect. So I thought about this all week. And then on Friday night, I was sitting with Methodists at Temple Israel, among some of the area's observant Jewish community. Sitting in the Methodist church in Marshfield, it's easy to feel like we're part of an old movement. I mean, we sing hymns written in the 1700s, which is when our movement was founded. Next to the Catholics and Lutherans, we're the oldest thing in this town. But sitting in the synagogue makes you realize that Methodists are toddlers on the world religion stage. I overheard someone from our church say after the Friday service that it felt like being in that worship service, like we were taking part in something ancient. While I was sitting there, I was thinking about Paul and that this was what he knew in many ways, Pharisaic Judaism, more modern and relaxed now for sure, 
but the same rhythm and scriptures and beliefs and prayers and attitude. Our attitude when we encounter the unexpected demonstrates a lot about our faith. On several occasions, I've seen people start to attend church right as something tragic and unexpected happens in their lives. Just a coincidence, maybe. I've seen two reactions to it, though. The first, thank God we got here in time because now we have a church family to walk with us through our struggle. We have a place to worship God as the roof falls down. The second reaction is, you know, I can't believe God is punishing me now that I'm attending church. I'm out. I visited the synagogue several times before. It was different this time. The worshipers, there were more of them, and they seemed more engaged. There were more hands on deck leading the service, and they were so appreciative of the hands. The service was explained as we went, and sometimes they just paused the service and talked directly to us. There were They were doing online ministry in a way that I'd never seen anybody do, and it was so seamless. The service was lay-led. It, there was not a rabbi in sight. Their rabbi comes in once a month from the state of California. Reform Judaism is facing the same clergy crisis churches are facing, but they're facing it differently. At least this one is. The synagogue in Springfield is growing. It is warming up. It is responding like the lack of a full-time rabbi is just another bump in a long road. Yes, it is. I sat in the service and wondered, how are they handling this so well? Why is the Christian movement panicking over the lack of clergy and they're not? Do, do we not know that God shows up in the unexpected? We're really so young a movement compared to the congregation I was worshiping with on Friday, and we're afraid. We're like those new people who come to church and then struggle. It's like we're new at this. And and this community, this Jewish community, saw the same situation, shrugged, and developed a new pattern so they could hold to their responsibility to honor and worship God and God's word. It was inspiring. I, I wondered whether Paul, in this time of extreme duress, acted like a rooted Jewish person or like a new Christian. Because he was a Roman citizen. He was a called apostle of Jesus Christ. And he was a trained Pharisee. He told the others on the ship the truth, the hard truth, the ignored truth. He was a prisoner on the ship. A ship on the way to Caesar in Rome. A ship in a storm that doesn't want to end. A ship that has no further way to prepare. A ship he's on because of his own stubbornness. It can't get any worse, right? In our shipwreck story, Paul will be the one who doesn't panic, the one who leads them forward. The prisoner will eventually take the helm because Paul expects the unexpected and he expects God to show up in the unexpected, just like the people at Temple Israel. I'm going to be prophetic here. The unexpected is going to happen. The unexpected good and the unexpected bad, and God is going to show up in the unexpected good and the unexpected bad and in unexpected ways. And how we respond to it will say something about our faith. Even though we Methodists are toddlers on the world religion stage, I wonder if we can be mature enough to expect God to show up in our unexpected Will you please pray with me? Lord, we love you. We say we trust you. But when things get bad, we sometimes withdraw that trust and panic and wail while you are behind our scenes making things work out for our good. We just don't always remember. We're so sure of who people are and what we can expect from day to day that we forget the unexpected can happen. We forget that you show up when the unexpected happens. You show up as the unexpected happening. A baby when the years for that have passed. A rainbow in the sky over dry ground. A parted sea we can cross. A lion's den full of lions that sleep through the night. A 
fiery furnace in which we're not alone, a little baby in a manger. So we won't ask you to show up anymore. You do know that. But we will ask that you help us see you and that you will help us remember when we can't see you that you are with us not just in the day-to-day, but in the extraordinary, unexpected parts of life.